Good evening. My name is Teresa. I'm an alcoholic. <sighs> grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober because of a loving God. <sighs> I'm always so nervous. I thought we were going to chat for a while, read some more stuff. <laughs> and then my heart was pounding. I was so nervous when he was reading. You know, I was hearing like Charlie Brown teacher, wah, 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 wah. I was tripping. I was like, okay. Because oh, I still listen when people do the readings in the meeting like, the, like it's the first time I heard it. Oh, oh gosh, okay. I always go, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. <sighs> I always have to uh, share with you what stands in the way of my usefulness to others. <laughs> um, and that is that to me this is the most awkward thing to do. I find it very vulnerable. Um, you know, I just never thought that my experience can benefit others. I really didn't. I don't remember when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous and I sat in those chairs, I said, I can't wait to get to that podium and talk to everybody about my life. <laughs> now, I know some speakers who love it. Do you know what I mean? Like, they couldn't wait, and they know they do it better than anybody else. That's just not my experience. Um, God has a sense of humor with me. I really believe that he thinks if I don't keep sharing it, I'm going to forget it. <laughs> Uh, and you guys are going to lose me around here. I'm that type of alcoholic. If I stay on the couch a little bit too long, I'm the one that goes, we're all going to die. <laughs> What's the point anyway? You know what I mean? It's scary. <laughs> it's really scary. Oh. And as much as this is uncomfortable and I don't like it and don't want to do it, it's a weird thing when everybody's looking at me. And and I really think it's funny how a lot of people go, it's not a big deal, it's just a bunch of drunks. And I'm like, we're the most critical, judgmental people. I don't see how that's something positive. I don't understand. And for the most part, I've seen people get up here to read and you sweating. So I don't get it. Anyway. You know, people come up to read and they're like, Ugh. you know, you just read, man. Chill out. I got to go disrobe myself in front of everybody. I'm not a performer. I'm not an entertainer. Uh, I was thinking about that. Where's the nervousness? I always pray and ask God to just allow me to be this conduit. And thank God the nervousness is not pride. I, I, I'm an alcoholic like everybody else. I'm not worried about what you think of me. It's just so disrobing. I don't know how to perform. I asked uh, my higher power to get rid of some character defects, and, you know, he heard me, and I need them back sometimes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Seriously, like, times like this, I could use that ego. You know what I mean? And that vanity, like, whatever, I'm it. I can't. I can't do it. And that I could lie and make up stories. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I just, like, I can't do it. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what's standing in my way. And I always go, you know, anytime, God, people staring at us. <laughs> this is your gig, you know what I mean? I'm here. I showed up. <laughs> now do your thing, man. <laughs> they they like looking at us, man. Anyway. Ooh, my heart is coming out my chest. So I'm probably going to tell on myself about something. That's why I'm scared, maybe. I don't know. Ooh. I want to thank Stephanie for her patience, being kind. I just keep thinking about that when she called me that she was going to pick me up. <laughs> she was like, you probably don't know me. I was like, nope, sure don't, but it doesn't really matter, <laughs> does it? You're going to come and get me anyway, huh? Before the meeting, it was like five minutes too. I was going outside. Where are you going? I'm leaving. I'm done. I don't want to do this. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> you thought I was going to do it? You're my ride. Okay. <laughs> And I love when people come up to me and be like, I heard you were great, and we bought some people, and I can't wait to hear you again. I'm always like, no pressure. But <laughs> 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 I don't feel like talking today. Oh, my gosh. And it's chlorine. No, chlorine. That, that sounds like a, like a liquid. Colleen. Yeah. <laughs> chlorine is a liquid, no? Anyway. Colleen. <laughs> I'd like to thank her for asking me to come out. This is my second time here. No, actually, third time, right? I'll hear this. Scott. Last time I was here, the roof went on fire. So that's the story that I was been given uh, when I got here. I turned the roof on fire to you guys. So I'm watching tonight. Um, 
It is an honor and a privilege to be asked to speak in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because you know what, newcomers, despite how much I don't want to do this, how uncomfortable this is, I got to do it for you. Because if I don't give this thing away, I can't keep it, and I don't get to keep coming back. And I know when I was new, the reason why I come up here and I do this is because when I was new, I came into these rooms, there were people standing up at this podium, and they carried a message to me. Now, I don't know if they were uncomfortable. I didn't know if there were things going on in their life, if they didn't want to do it. But I know because they did it, they carried a message that planted a seed and helped me to come back another day. So I want to welcome anybody who's new. Welcome home. We've been praying for you, and we really have. I will always say this because I heard it when I got here, and I experience it in every meeting that I go to and just about all over the world, and I've been to a lot of meetings and many other countries and small islands and places. And in every single meeting all over the world, there is a moment of silence and prayer, and that is for you. But for the grace of God, you have been lifted up and brought into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's not your idea, newcomers. It is not. You've been given a gift, and it's a gift unearned. We ask you to keep coming back. Don't leave five minutes before the miracle happens. Let us love you so you can learn to love yourself. I wish you the gift of desperation. Strap on and hold on, because you about to go for a ride. <laughs> when I got here, they told me this was the hardest thing I was ever going to have to do, and you ain't lying. And I've been through some stuff in my life, but this has been a journey. I always say AA is like Disneyland or something. Boy, I've been on a roller coaster. I feel like I've been abducted and dropped off in another planet. <laughs> Even though the newcomer is the most important person in the room, and that you are, we need you. I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for the old timers. So I want to thank you for my life and my sobriety, and I still want what you have, and I will never want to lose that. I want to thank you for continuously showing up, sitting in your favorite seat, that same seat. You know, there's something about the old timers that get that seat, and there's something about seeing that same face week after week in that seat. If you be new, they're the most quiet person in the room. They don't say much. I always say they remind me of Confucius or have you seen Kung Fu back in the day? <laughs> they were like the master of the Kung Fu guy. He used to say, take the coin from my hand, grasshopper. They're like that. They still sweep the floors, they put up the chairs, they extend their hand. They've been hanging out with each other for a while. I like the old timers. They've been hanging out with each other for like 30 something years. I like watching them. Some of them still don't like each other for the last 30 years. <laughs> I like that. You know what I'm saying? They've been hanging out in the same room for 30 something years, and one of them gets up to share, My name is Jim, I'm an alcoholic. Everybody else be like, oh. <laughs> There he goes. I love that. Love it. Thank you for setting the example. A lot of the old timers where I got sober have gone up to the big meeting in the sky. And it is my job and my responsibility to carry the same message that they carried to me. I got sober in South Central Los Angeles, 9604 in Crenshaw, Alano, and I'll be forever grateful for where my feet was landed. <laughs> my sobriety date is March 29, 1990. But for the grace of God, I have been with you for the last 23 years. Thank God is one day at a time. I don't know if I would have got here and said, well, I'm going to be here forever. I get nervous when people say that. I'm done. I'm not drinking ever, ever again. And I'm, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> that scares me. <laughs> I always tell the newcomer, don't be fooled. We're still waiting for science to one day accomplish it. <laughs> at least I am. <laughs> I be watching the news. I'll be like, they got a pill? What's happening? Did, did anybody catch that, what they say? <laughs> you think I'm joking? <laughs> oh, goodness. We share in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. There's a reason for that. In our doctor's opinion, he talks about depth and weight. It is the language of the heart. It is the music that I have found in these rooms. It is the only thing that has captured my attention. And if you be new, I hope you hear the music. 
For you see, it goes past your disease that is centered in your thinking. It goes straight into your heart, and you can't drink the same again. And so sometimes I like to do a little disclaimer. Like rated R, adult content, nudity, parental guidance, suggested. You know, whenever I don't do that, there's always somebody who comes up after me and be like, that was a bit much. <laughs> I've gone to other countries where people have said, I'm so grateful that Teresa told such a tragic story with a happy ending. So people tell me I should write a book, I should make a movie out of it, where I believe this story serves its best purpose is in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've come a long way. You can't tell me there isn't a God and that this program does not work. I've been saying that God's a show-off. Because only he could take a girl like me, pick me up, dust me off, so you could see what he can do. <laughs> That's a show-off. <laughs> oh, goodness. As the story goes, this don't change. My mother did not want another child. She was happy with my brother, she was disgusted with my father, and she just wanted to be with my brother. But my dad wanted another child, he wanted a girl. So according to my mother, I am a product of rape. My father has an entirely different perspective on that situation and they can fight that out as long as they want to. When I was born, I was born sick, I was born a preemie, my mother is an alcoholic. I don't say that because I label her an alcoholic. She's an, al an admitted alcoholic and Alcoholics Anonymous. My mother has 27 years of sobriety. And according to my mother, she wanted to abort me. She wanted to get rid of me. She was doing alcohol. She was doing drugs. She tried to fall down the stairs. She tried to stick hangers up inside of her. She tried to do all kinds of things. Needless to say, I'm meant to be here because I'm here. I was born sick and I was born in the hospital. My mother told my father, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to see it. You keep it away from me and you take it. And she left the hospital and she left me there. My grandmother and my father came and got me and they brought me home. Now according to them, in order to help me to stop crying, they had to put alcohol in my gums or in my body. Nothing else would stop me from crying. So my mother and my father came up with an idea because my mother refused to touch me how can we get my mother to even look at me? So what they decided to do was to take my brother and leave me alone with my mother. When they left, according to my mother, as I began to cry, she tried to muffle out the noise by putting the pillow over her ears, and she couldn't. So she went to the crib and she tried to put the pillow on my face to muffle up the noise, and she remembered, if you give her alcohol, she'll stop crying. From that moment on, my mother made sure that I had alcohol in my system 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, for years, I used to parrot what I heard people say in the rooms that I don't blame my relationship with alcohol with my parents. I don't say that no more. That's not true. My relationship with alcohol begins in the fetus, and it was my mother's job to keep me intoxicated. I don't know when I made my conscious decision to drink, I was never given a conscious decision to drink. I don't know when it was an option for me to drink. I never had any options whether I was going to drink or not. As I got older, my mother would make sure that I wouldn't get off the couch unless I finished two bottles of Johnny Walker Red and a carton of cigarettes. I drank in my house. I don't need no peer pressure. I didn't have to go to school and drink with my friends. My mother supplied it. My cousins, my uncles, my family members are gangsters dope dealers, hustlers, and all that was going on in my house. I didn't have to go out to the streets to discover anything. This was my family. I was brought up in the projects in New York City. I'm this Puerto Rican girl where the same thing that was going on in the projects was the same thing that was going on in the mountains in Puerto Rico. I didn't see nothing different. I lost my virginity at the age of five. Men and women took turns with my body. To this day, I don't know if I was sold. I just know that everybody wanted to have sex with me. And I had sex with them. Who's next? Three or four of you? Five of you? The man? The neighbor? The cousin? The family? The school people? I don't know. Who's next? I was physically abused, verbally abused. The only thing that I heard was, I'm stupid. You're an idiot. You're incompetent. You're ugly. Get out of my face. Get in the corner. I was spit on, kicked on, punched on, pushed around, kicked in the stomach, knocked in the head, 
That was my experience growing up. I lived like that my whole life. Thank God for alcohol. Because I don't know if alcohol talked to you, but it talked to me. And what alcohol said to me was, if nobody loves you, I love you. If nobody wants you, I want you. I got you, man. I got your back. I'll take care of you. You don't need nothing, and you don't need nobody. You all right? You cool? Just go in there, suck it up, and handle your business. I didn't cry. I wasn't shocked or appalled. I didn't plan on running away. I didn't say tomorrow needs to be different. This is the life I live. This is a lifestyle. I was breeded on my character defects. Always say I came to Alcoholics Anonymous to get adjectives for my behavior. <laughs> you guys are like selfish. I was like, really? That's interesting. <laughs> There's a label to that? Okay, I hear you. <laughs> I couldn't have survived the world I came from with the spiritual principles that I live by today. I had to be arrogant. This sense of fearlessness without you knowing that I was afraid on the inside. I wasn't even present on the inside. I wasn't present for any of my experiences. I used to be, well, I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous for the consequences of my drinking. Consequences don't get my attention. The good days for me is getting sodomized, gang raped, and pistol whipped. I go to the bathroom, I fix my hair, I put on my makeup, I straighten up my clothes, I take a drink, and I go back out there and do it all over again. Those are the good old days when I am not present for my experience. I was willing to die that way. I was willing to die like everybody else in my family. Kidney failure, cirrhosis of the liver, falling down, cracking your skull, getting shot, ODing. And when you die in my family, we celebrate. When you're born, we cry. And at your funeral, we find your drink or your drug of choice, we put it in the coffin, we take pictures with you. And I was going to die like everybody else. I've seen people shot, OD, I walk down the street with my cousin, he gets shot, oh well, can't hang out with you no more. Next. I wasn't about anybody loving me and me loving you. Burn bridges, of course. What, you want a long-term relationship? I don't want to see you again. I didn't share my booze. I wasn't about doing rounds for everybody at the club. I'm not into that. This is mine, okay? And I don't share. I always describe it this way. I'm a smoker, okay? I smoke a pack of cigarettes a day. There are 20 cigarettes in a pack. If I give you one, that leaves me 19. That's a dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I share that, somebody always asks me to ask me for a cigarette. I live different today, okay? I share my cigarettes today. <laughs> Man, when I talk about what it was like, I feel like I'm talking about myself in third person. Like I'm talking about a stranger. Talk about living two lifestyles in one lifetime. That was the norm. I hung out in bars. I hung out in clubs. My playgrounds were shooting galleries, crack houses, bars, and clubs. I didn't play with no Barbie doll, no hot scotch, or no jump rope. My friends were 20, 30 years my senior. I didn't know how to have a conversation with kids my age. My mother was always in and out of mental institutions, jumping out of windows, cutting her wrists. So we were always in group therapy, individual therapy, family therapy. I've seen enough ink blots and two-way mirrors, man. What you gonna do for me? All those ink blots look like butterflies. I don't see how they're gonna address my issue. I used to go up to Fresh Air Fun programs where they take inner city kids out upstate New York and you ride donkeys and eat apple pie and whatever, whatever, man, whatever. <laughs> I didn't know that I was arrogant. I didn't know that I was suffering from a soul sickness. I didn't know that I had a spiritual malady. I don't remember looking at television saying I want to be like Marsha from the Brady Bunch. Do you know that that girl used to get a pimple and lose her mind? Do you ever seen that one, that episode? Whatever. <laughs> I got a pimple. I was like, oh my God, ooh, that's scary. <laughs> you want to see something real scary, you know what I'm saying? Anyway. <laughs> At the same time, I went to Catholic school. I went to Catholic school for 11 and a half years. I put a uniform on and a smile on my face. I said, the hell, Mary and the Our Father. I did my confession. 
confession on Saturdays and I showed up on Sunday and took the communion. I even sang in the choir. What about it? This is a lifestyle. And alcohol is my friend, it is my companion, it is my lover. It is everything to me. It is my oxygen. Thank God for good sponsorship. I remember when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was like, I never had that one's too many and a thousand's not enough, and I didn't dance butt naked on tables, and I didn't chug a luck. And my, my sponsor took me to downtown Skid Row, Los Angeles, to introduce me to myself. Because you see, if you've been drinking for as long as I've been drinking, your tolerance level changed. I needed less and less. Before I came to you, I just needed a sip. My bloodstream was filled with alcohol. I didn't learn about the four food groups until I got here. I didn't eat. I didn't go through meals. If I got a meal and I went to a neighbor and asked for an egg or something, I just started learning about hunger pains recently. I didn't even know what that was. I was like, I don't know, my stomach be hurting from time to time. It's very weird. I had a sponsor that was like, that's called hunger pains. You have to eat. I was like, oh, that's very interesting. It hurts very bad. It's very painful. Incomprehensible demoralization is a whole lot of things, people. <laughs> that was my life. <laughs> so what happened to me? How did I end up coming here? You told me not to forget my last drunk, and if you be new, I hope you don't forget it. That every time you think about your last run and your last drunk, you get so sick to your stomach, you just want to throw up. Because I've had some good times. But it was the last six, month of, six months of my life that I don't ever want to repeat. And other people can tell you, you know what, Teresa, you lived a hard life, and you should never want to go back to that life. And I don't have a problem going back to that life when I go back into a state of oblivion and I'm not present. I could have lived like that for a long time until somebody took me or blew me away or whatever. What started happening to me at the age of 24, for whatever reason, alcohol betrayed me is what it did. Alcohol turned its back on me. You say it stopped working. All I can tell you is that for whatever reason, at the age of 24, I became present for my experience. And I believe that's different. And alcohol left me emotionally retarded with no coping skills in a world that is very scary. And I didn't know what to do with it. And all I can remember is sitting at a bar, taking a drink, looking at you, and you were still ugly. <laughs> now, I know how this works. And I took another drink, and I turned around, and you were still ugly. And that's scary. Now, I don't know if that's scary for you, but that's scary for me. Because I know you're supposed to transform by now, because that's how that works. I know you're scary when I walk in, but I'm not tripping on you just yet. You take a little bit, you turn back around, and you look great. But now I took another drink, and I looked at you. Not only were you still scary, still ugly, I still went home with you. You have a problem. All of a sudden, I was present for my experience, where I noticed the look of disgust on your face where before I never paid attention. When all of a sudden I walk into the bar and I hear them say, look what the trash bought in. How long have they been saying that? I can't tell you how long they've been saying it, but I remember when I heard it. To me that's different. I always slept with strangers. So what? But now all of a sudden I notice and I can't shake that off. And now I'm getting paranoid? I ain't never been paranoid. I'm walking through alleys at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Paranoid? Me? I don't do paranoid. How are you supposed to live life like that? Where now I can't even take the bath because the water hurts my skin. I can't even look in the mirror and act as if anymore. I know how to dress up my outsides even though I'm dying on the inside. And it ain't working. And now my insides are all on my outsides. And I can't fix that. And the lover that I had always turned to, that always said it would never leave me, left me. What am I supposed to do now? I've been drinking since fetus. The sun comes through the window and it burns my skin. I didn't even know what it was. And people were moving too fast. And everybody was just...
just moving around me very, very quickly. I need everybody to just stop moving. I don't want to do that again. And I drink because I have to. Because I'm shaking and I'm sick if I don't. And I want to shake it off and I want to get a grip and I want to get it together, but I can't get it together. And to me, it's a cold thing when your solution is to invite death. I invite death into my life and death don't even take me out. What is that about? I put death on my inventory. I don't know if anybody else did that. I put death. How dare you? I invited you. I called on you. I begged you to take me out of my misery and you not come and get me? You leave me here? Doing this day after day after day after day? Come on, man. Thank God for sanity to return. I love when I hear people say, oh, I never want to drink again, or I'm so glad I'm sober, and this is so wonderful, and it's just tragic that I don't have to live my life like that. I say, thank God for sanity. Because when I'm in a state of unconsciousness, and I'm an insane, I don't think about those things. It does not even occur to me. I just want to die. All I can tell you is that one day, I did the aimless walk. I would say the walk out into the abyss with no purpose, no agenda, no destination. It's just a walk. And I ended up in a church. St. Parsons Boulevard in Queens. Wasn't looking for that church. Wasn't asking for that church. And I've done that walk since. And it ain't a straight line either. <laughs> And I stepped inside that church, and I felt the presence. It's more like what I feel when I walk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Every time I come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I do what I did in that church that day. Every time I walk in, I always stop at the door. I walk in, and I stop, and I go, because there's an energy in here that just wraps around you, you know? And I went into that church, and I felt this presence. It was huge. And I said a prayer. And I said, God, bless you. I said, God, please allow me to feel the peace that I feel in this church inside of me. But you see, the funny thing is, was that I didn't want it forever. I just wanted a moment for my head to shut up. And for my skin to stop crawling and for my stomach to stop turning. Just for a moment. I had no idea that that prayer was going to change my life. I really didn't. I don't ever want to forget that moment of desperation, isolation, bewilderment, disgust. I don't ever want to forget that moment in my life. It was horrible. I couldn't breathe. I was so disgusted with being in my own skin. I want the good old days back. I want the days back where it just don't matter. How do you do that? Incomprehensible demoralization is a whole lot of things. But when you can't get drunk and you can't get sober, it's the worst place for a drunk like me to be. I ain't mad at people who go back out there and drink and have a good time. And then start about starting prohibition again. I got sponsors that realize they call me. I'm like, you having fun? Is it good? How's it working? Is it working for you? No, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's what I tell. I'm so sorry. I wish it was working for you. <laughs> I had nowhere else to go. What else am I supposed to do? How do you go another 24 hours without killing yourself or somebody else? From there, I got bought 3,000 miles from New York City to California. I detoxed on a Greyhound bus. I threw up. I shook. I sweated. I hallucinated. I don't want to do that again. I had my last drink in El Paso, Texas. There was a man on that bus that I believe saved my life. I was sick. More people died from alcohol detox than anything else. I could have died on that bus. I was sick. That man said, I know what you need. You got to come with me. 
you got to come with me. And he carried me from the bus depot to this bar. He got a drink. He held it to my mouth. And I drank it like a dog that had been out of water. I was sick. And I believe that that drink helped me come the rest of the way. I wouldn't have made it. And I arrived in downtown Los Angeles on March 29, 1990. My sobriety date. My mother was there to pick me up. I was wearing a size one pair of pants with two pants underneath. I had a huge sweatshirt, my hair all over the place. Beat up, banged up, because all I knew was physical abuse and relationships. No, that's my man. He beats me. So what? What you talking about? He loves me. <laughs> I was four months pregnant with a dead baby in my, ba in my belly. That was my fourth child. All my babies fall out in toilets and floors. All of them. I'm amazed at women who have children in their disease. Amazed. My womb was always so polluted I couldn't keep no child. I would notice when it would fall. I'd be like, oh no, look, check it out, people. I was pregnant. <laughs> Moving on. And my mother picked me up and dropped me off in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she left me there. I was 3,000 miles from New York City. She turned me over to the very people who saved her life. She left me there because you told her to. She couldn't help me. I crawled into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because a tradition that you have around here, which is called attraction rather than promotion. It is what I saw in you that made a difference to me. You see, it's what Bill saw in Ebby that captured his attention, not what he said. I saw that gleam in your eye and that camaraderie and warmth that you have with one another. I remember that nobody ever shunned me or sucked their teeth at me or tried to shove a pamphlet down my throat. And I crawled into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous like I had 20 bullet holes in me. I was bleeding all over the place. I am not interested in your credentials. I just need to know if you got a needle on a thread. <laughs> this is the last house on the block, yo. I didn't come here to play with you people. This ain't no social club. It ain't about being cute. It ain't the end thing. This is it. And if you can't help me, somebody needs to blow my brains out because I can't do another 24 like this. I am so grateful for the old timers that were there when I got here. I always say I feel like a baby in a baby basket left at the doorsteps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been adopted by AA. It was the old timers that picked up that basket and they spoon fed me and they began to nurture me to a new way of life. And they loved me like I had never been loved before. I didn't even understand that they were loving me. Because I didn't even know what love looked like. You know what I mean? I came to Alcoholics Anonymous to learn that my name is Teresa. Not stupid. Not ugly. Not idiot. Not incompetent. You didn't tell me get out of my face. You disgust me. You said keep coming back. It's good to see you. I remember Marcy this old time. You say, Teresa, there's this beautiful light inside of you. And we just want that light to shine. And I would hear them say, you deserve to live. God don't make no junk. They gave me a sponsor. Thank God you didn't ask me to pick one, fire them, change them, interview them. <laughs> I don't want to pick nobody. They said, this woman is your sponsor. And all I needed to know was that she had a working knowledge of the steps in the book. I learned the traditions long before I understood the steps. Thank God for the traditions. They're not laws. There's no AA police, even though there's some people who think they are. It doesn't matter. <laughs> they could think that. That's the beauty of it. They think they are, and I go, you're so funny. <laughs> you got to report me to central office. <laughs> We're in upside down pyramid. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I learned principles before personalities. Helped me so much. Because even though I was beat up, I was still vain, arrogant, judgmental, and self-righteous. And shallow and superficial. Because my stuff didn't stink. And I could look at what's wrong with all of you. And the traditions knocked that out of the box. None of my business. It don't matter your politics, you got money, no money, short, tall, black, white, live here, live there. It's none of my business. 
the way you dress, the way you... It's none of my business. Your politics, your, your sports, I don't want to talk to you about it. It pushes me away from you. The only thing I need to know is that you're a drunk. The only thing you need to know is I'm a drunk. It helps if you're Puerto Rican, though. I have to say that, honestly. <laughs> There's something about that that makes a difference. I'm sorry. I can't say it, does it? <laughs> something about Boricos. We're like, ah, family! Nothing else matters. Anyway. The only requirement is a desire to want to stop drinking. That helped me so much. You can't throw me out. I'm a member. You should have seen me. My first year was a mess. I'm a member, okay? I don't care if you don't like me. I don't like you either, all right? But I'm a member, and you have to help me. <laughs> As for you for my home group, they were like, oh, my God, that girl's crazy. And where are you going to the meeting after the meeting? You know, recently I had moved to Minnesota for a while, and I went to one of their meetings. It was so funny. I went to the meeting, and they do like round robin or something. And you know, everybody takes turns. And they came to me, and I go, could you share? I was like, okay, look, all right? I just moved here for a few months, all right? I have a home group, okay? And I don't like your home group, all right? Your format is very weird. This meeting is very, very strange. This place is ugly, it's dark, and it smells. You people look very, very strange. I don't like the way any of you look. But despite all that, okay, I need your phone number. <laughs> I need a commitment so I could come back here next week. <laughs> and where's the meeting after the meeting? <laughs> they were like, thanks for sharing. Because <laughs> none of that matters, you know what I mean? What difference does that make? <laughs> My life depends on this. I learned that this is a life and death errand. And then I keep coming back, and I keep coming back. I've done the uncomfortable until it became comfortable. All 12 steps are contrary to my natural desires. Ain't nothing fun about this. I'm so grateful that nobody lied to me when I got here. I would have been really upset if everybody had been like, program is so great, I'm so happy I'm sober. You lie, you lie. This is hard. The 12 and 12 tells me that. The big book tells me that. It's a simple program for complicated people. I am self-will run riot. To my core, I am selfish and self-centered. That is the root of all my problems. And it's only but a power greater than myself that needs to do for me what I cannot do for myself. I can't even will this to myself. This is not a self-help program. This is in cognitive therapy. I can't talk myself to death to get this. It's about action and more action and more action, a spiritual program of action. I must find a power greater than myself. They didn't give me options. This whole thing about it suggested you might want to, they didn't talk to me like that when I got here. When I got here, they said, sit down, shut up, and listen. You take the cotton out of your ears, you put it in your mouth, your best thinking got you here. You can't even kill yourself right. Shut up. Sit down somewhere. That's how good you are. They gave me the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. They told me it was a textbook. It was meant to be studied. It is not a novel. They got my attention. I don't know if they talked to everybody else like that, but they talked to me. They knew how to talk to me. I'm a sassy little smart girl, boy. A judge classified me a genius when I was 12. I was emancipated at 14. <laughs> I'm so grateful to this program. God knew what he was doing. He had me in the middle of the liars with the liars, the hustlers with the hustlers, and the cheaters with the cheaters, boy. There's a lot of geniuses up in here. They were like, yeah, Jimmy, too. What about it? And we still up in here, right? We didn't do something right. <laughs> they told me to dumb me up, man, if I wanted to stay here another day. They told me, follow the black on the white. I'm so grateful I wasn't around people that want to sit around and let me just verbiage, just talk mess and dialogue and process. I don't think about processing. There's no blender or nothing like that here. They told me, you follow the black on the white. You do as we do. You want what we have, you do as we do. And I followed the black on the white. I don't know. I don't know nothing. Like the first page of the big book, it was blank. They told me to read it. I said, it's blank. There's nothing there. They said, exactly. You don't know nothing. <laughs> Just don't 
come born like you know something. And the longer I've been here sober, the more I think I know, the less I know. Nowadays I go, don't call me because I might change it next week. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. Some of my sponsees that have been with me earlier in my recovery, they're like, you're getting soft. Maybe because I'm older, no, in age and sobriety, now I'll be like, whatever, 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 whatever. I got to reserve my energy just so I can stay sober today. I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm so confused at this point. <laughs> talking about when you're younger like before five years you be sounding good right da, 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 big book thumb and I'm like I don't even know I don't even know <laughs> I just know you know it just reminds me how old is old timers like 50 something years you know sobriety in my home group you go to him you're like how, how'd you do it he just be like one day at a time he'd be like well that was profound <laughs> guess that's the best you can do after a while you know what I'm saying <laughs> You told me all I needed was the mustard seed of willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness. My sponsor remember her telling me, you don't know what honesty is, so you tell me everything and I'll shift to the BS. <laughs> open-mindedness was, is it possible, Teresa, that you just don't know everything? Is that possible? I love how the old-timers would ask me what step I was on, and if I didn't say I was up to 10, they say I can't talk to you because sanity doesn't return until step 10. <laughs> You ain't got to 10 yet, can't talk to you. <laughs> Doesn't return until 10. <laughs> but I got myself. As I said, all I needed to know that my sponsor had a working knowledge of the steps. Thank God, because if I would have tore down her personality, I probably, she wouldn't be able to save my life. And after my first year birthday, when I blew out that candle, my sponsor looked at me and said, happy birthday. Now it is no longer about you. And for the last 22 years, it's been about carrying the message to those who still sick and suffer. I've had to go to meetings so I could put up chairs or sweep the floors, extend my hand. I don't come to a meeting to check in, my sponsor told me. This is not a hotel or an airport. I don't come to a meeting for therapy so I could purge. I come here to carry the message of my experience, strength, and hope. For an hour and a half, I'm safe. Because if all else fails, you work with another alcoholic. The only thing that ensures permanent sobriety is working with another alcoholic. They have burned into my consciousness, trust God, clean house, be of service. Trust God, clean house, be of service. I've been brainwashed. <laughs> and I remember when I was new, I used to say that. You're brainwashing me. They used to say, your brain needs washing. <laughs> so funny. They were loving me. You know, for a girl who never listened to nobody, you know what I mean, had authority issues or whatever we call that, I listened to these people. Because they were doing it because their life depended on it. Sometimes when I see some of them today, I just start crying. Because you know, they didn't hold me to that. It wasn't like we're spending this time with you so that you could stay sober. We're doing this because we stay sober. We don't know what you're going to do. But I want to stay sober today. So I do this. Life's been in session in the last 23 years. I've been through a lot. All those things I didn't feel for 24 years of my life, I felt them in here. All those knocks, all those hits, all those loss of children, all the pain, all the abandonment, all that stuff, I, felt, I experienced it here. And I put one hand in God and one hand in Alcoholics Anonymous. Everything in these last 23 years are all new experiences. Everything was new. I had the first time learning what it is to fall in love or to be heartbroken. I remember I got in, there's an infidelity, you know, my partner slept with somebody, and I remember I was crying. It would hurt so bad. I was crying for like three days, and I was going through the 12 and 12, not looking for the answer, but just to get through the day. And after the three days, I was like, O-M-G. <laughs> I called my sponsor. I was like, check this out. I must have been in love. Because you can't be heartbroken unless you're in love, right? And I was like, that's amazing! <laughs> I was in love because people, people who are not in love don't get heartbroken. Did I get that wrong? You have to be in love to be heartbroken. No, you're looking at me funny. Doesn't it work like that? <laughs> you're scaring me. Everybody's scaring me. I'm like, oh, man, I got that wrong? No, I was in love. No, because then I got heartbroken. I was like, oh, my God, that's too so painful. That hurts really bad. <laughs> I learned that feelings weren't fact, but I have them. I'm so grateful that you taught me to just be. I don't have to fix anything. 
that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be at this moment, that I get to learn from all of your experiences, and I listen to you, and I go to you. What is that like to work? What is that like to be happy in your life? What is it like to be in love for a long time? What is it like to lose somebody? I don't know. I never experienced anything. I was never present. So I'm present here. I've had money. I've lost money. In my fifth year of sobriety, I always say I met God butt naked alone with a white flag off my ass. No. <laughs> I ain't been confused since he's running the show, man. I am no longer the CEO of Teresa Incorporated. <laughs> Seems to work better that way. <laughs> I used to be my own board of directors. You know what I mean? Not even the board of directors, the directors. <laughs> Life run by myself don't work. Life's in session. And I've had to learn how to live life on life terms without a drink or a drug. How do I live this thing called life present from my experience? Because you see, alcohol ain't gonna fix it no more. So I've learned how to grow up around here, emotionally. And I've cleaned house. I didn't wanna be blocked from the sunlight of the spirit. I wanted to see the light as I saw in you. I work hard for that. So that wherever I go, whether it be in the rooms or outside the rooms, people can see what this power can do. I can't take no credit for it. I don't get to pat myself on the back. That's why I say God's a show off. And I watch this power do things for me that I could not do for myself. And I watch this power demonstrate itself through me what it can do. I've been a witness. I've been an observer of me become a lady, a woman of integrity and dignity and grace and gratitude and compassion and love. I've watched that happen to me. I didn't make that happen to me. I didn't act like I was that. I have become that as a direct result of these steps and this power. And I only get a daily reprieve. That's what's trippy about that. It don't matter what I did yesterday. It don't matter what I'm going to do tomorrow. It only matters what I do right now, this moment. That's all that matters. I don't tell you it's not an option for me to drink. Some people say that. Not me, because I've had many options. I don't tell you it's not, I don't have no excuse to drink. That's not true. I got tons. You want to talk after the meeting? I've got a bunch. I've written it all out. <laughs> the miracle is that despite every option, every excuse, every reason, every circumstance, I haven't. I haven't. That trips me out. Some people go, thank you so much, Teresa, for your kindness. I'm like, you better thank God, because I have other plans. <laughs> I swear, I saw the situation going in an entirely different direction. I really, really did. I'm shocked just as much as you are. Did you just witness compassion? Me too. That was trippy. I so wanted to punch you in the face. I was so there. But I did this thing called inventory, and now I'm like, thank you for sharing. How can I be of service to you? Oh, my God, that was interesting. Did you see that? Amazing. I get to show up even when I don't want to. And there are many times I don't want to. And then there's times I just can't wait. That I just can't wait to be here and to get here. As I said, life's been in session for me. And it's been in session for 23 years. It's not even like it's new. I was homeless at five years of sobriety. I lost my grandmother when I had six months. I've had jobs, I've had a lot of money, then I've had like no money. In the last few years, I've been living like Mother Teresa or that Lady Alma who gives hugs. It's very strange. <laughs> I used to work in corporations, but I, every time I clean house, God, what will you have me be? What will you have me do? Take all of me, good and bad. What do you want me to do today? What do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? And as I said, I didn't know my experience was going to benefit others. I, I travel the world without a dime in my pocket. I don't know if you're going to feed me. I don't know if I'm going to eat whatever state or country I go to. But I get on that plane. 
I don't know where I'm asleep when I get there, but I get on that plane. No idea. I've been of service to my family. I've helped my perpetrators, people who have harmed me. My first inventory, I went back to New York and made amends to all of the people who harmed me. I have more people on there who harmed me than I did harm to others. I have a lot of abusers. But I was willing to go to any lengths because that's what you told me to do, that I had to clean house and clean up my side of the street. And I've had to learn the gift of forgiveness so that I could stay sane and sober and knock on those doors and say, I don't have a right to hate you. My mother been taking care of my mother. That's a whole other story. Oh, have we danced the dance. <laughs> and my mother has Alzheimer's now. She had Alzheimer's and alcoholism. That's a trip. I can't tell which one is really active at the moment. And I get to love her. <laughs> that ain't easy some days. My father lives out here in Phoenix. I get to come and spend time with him, daddy, right now. I'm daddy's little girl. I'm, I'm kind of, let me tell you, whoo, I'm on a ride right now, boy. Damn, I'm on a ride. My spiritual muscles are just stretching. Daddy has dementia on him. He's in pampas and he can't eat and he's in a wheelchair. Daddy can't talk. He can't even recognize me. Oh, I'm freaking out. And I text my sponsor at the nursing home where he's in a group hospice or something. They just told me he might not make it any moment. I'm here at a meeting. I don't know if my father's dying right now, but all I know is I have to come to speak in the meeting in Scottsdale. I don't know what else to do. That doesn't help the new person. I don't know. I can't stop daddy from dying, but I can help you not die. I don't know, and I don't want to die. I don't know what else to do about that. That's, that's what you taught me. And I text my sponsor sitting with my dad, and I'm like, I'm being very selfish right now. <laughs> you know, I'm just thinking about what I want, and I can't get out of myself. So I have to tell him myself. Do you know what I mean? I can't think about him. I'm not thinking about him. I'm only thinking about me. And I want to say, stop it, Daddy. Talk to me. Look at me. I don't want you to do this right now. They called me before I came out here, and they said, we don't think your father's going to make it through the night. And they passed the phone to him. I told, called my sponsor. I told my dad, don't do this to me right now. I'm sure the nurse was like, oh, my God, that's your daughter? <laughs> Stop it. You told, I told you I was coming on the 7th, and you're not dying now. Just, but don't do it on the 7th either. See what I'm saying? I just buried my brother. I just had to put my brother on life support and take him off. I'm, I'm just a little tired. I keep saying, Mother Teresa saying, is God doesn't give you more than you can handle, but sometimes he underestimates me. <laughs> <laughs> And the whole time with my brother, I had to keep praying. You gave me tools. You laid them at my feet, and I've had to learn how to apply them to my life. They're not exercises. They're not homework. I've got to learn how to live with these tools. I put down the drink, and I pick up the big book of alcohol. It's anonymous. And the doctors tell me that I have to decide to take my brother off of all these things, and I have to pray. And I say, God, please remove my selfishness, my self-seeking, my fear, because I know what I want, but I can't play God today. What do you want me to do? How can I be of maximum service to you? And the funny thing is, is that none of this got anything to do with Teresa. That one day this experience is going to benefit somebody else. And I got to suit up and I got to show up. Because many of you have done it. And I watched my brother take his last breath. I didn't want that to happen. That just happened. And I had to move all his apartment. He's a single dad and I lost my nephews. He raised those boys, me and him, raised those boys for the last 10 and 15 years. Thank God they never seen me drunk. What an honor that was. And when my brother died, their mother showed up and said, those are my kids. And they said, we don't know her. She said, I don't care. Those are my kids. And you're just their aunt. You get out of my face. And I don't want you around us ever again. Oh, my womb hurts. And I call my sponsor and I pause. I don't hurt that lady. I changed their diapers. I potty trained them. I don't tell her that because you taught me not to do that. And I pause. And I write. And I call my sponsor. And I talk about my wrongs, not my rights. And I ask God to remove them. Because Teresa playing God ain't cute. 
and all I will do will cause harm to me, her, and those boys. My experience tells me so. And I gotta let go and let God. Ooh, that ain't easy. Life's in session. But I'm sober. No matter what, I'm sober. Without a dime in my pocket. <laughs> ain't never to work, can't even do anything, but I'm sober. And I'm here. In Scottsdale. <laughs> with 112. You think we can get a little cooler weather? Whatever. But I'm going to end with this. It's arrogant for me to say, if I can do it, you can do it. But if you knew and you have no, come close to no kind of experience that I've had, please listen to the similarities and not the differences. And if this power can do this to a girl like me, could you imagine what he can do for you? So I want to thank you for loving me until I can learn to love myself. Thank you for allowing the God in you to help find the God within me so that I in return can do the same for those in these rooms and outside of the rooms. I want to thank you so much for doing a 12-step call on me right now. I really want to thank you for allowing me to come here and just get out of myself for a minute. Just for an hour. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share.